Summit Church, Pastor Eric here. I'm with my friends Kane the Band. Hello. They are amazing. Listen, you are in for such a treat. We just got a great show tonight. Oh, great show. In we Utah. We're on our bus, but listen, you're in for a special treat this morning. Yep. I'm telling you right now, my dad, Sam Tim, is going to be bringing so the word. Go. I wish Put I was your hands there. together. All right, let's slow clap it up. Here we go. Yes, yes. I love it. All right, Dad, love you. You're more than welcome. Have a great Sunday, everybody. Amen. Amen. God bless. That's my son. <laughs> he sent that video. I'm going to give you this picture. That, uh, he's, first of all, Jan, stand, please. My wife. <laughs> Eric has been our son since the day he was born. And you notice he looks like a conehead. <laughs> there was just a lot of brain in there that had to squeeze in and before it could squeeze out. That, that's all I can say. He's a unique character. I thought I'd show a couple other pictures. If you're the speaker, if you're the uh, preacher, then you can show pictures of your kids. Okay, so here, uh, we're going to blip through a couple of them here. He was uh, always crying about something. <laughs> This one I could show lower, but I'd probably get arrested. <laughs> so I decided, eh, we'll leave it right there. We'll cut it off. Uh, he's a cute little boy, Never, nevertheless. And then he's growing up, of course, and now he is what he is. So we are so glad to be here and so glad that you have uh, invested your lives in trusting him to be the pastor of Summit Church and that he will be a blessing to this church, you will be a blessing to him, and you will in turn be a blessing to the community and to all those that are around and that God will be honored and uplifted right here in this zip code. Now, Jan and I have been in the ministry for 45 plus years. I actually have been in the ministry a little longer than that because I started as a single person, as a youth pastor over in Stillwater, Minnesota. I'm going back about 48 years ago, uh, well, I take that back, almost 49 years ago, uh, started as a youth pastor in, over in Stillwater, Minnesota. But Jan and I have been in ministry together for 45 years and serving the Lord with uh, the very best of our heart that we could do and honor the Lord. Now, quite honestly, uh, we've entered into the retirement status and I want to tell you, retirement is not underrated, all right, just to, to, let, to let you guys know. Now, but, but that in mind, uh, it's been a year and a half, that was about a year and a half ago, it's been a year and a half since I've preached a sermon, since I've stood in the pulpit, so I've got to confess, it's a little scary. And I've wondered whether I've even forgotten how to preach. And, but, but then I thought of this story. A little boy selling the lawnmower, and he had a yard sale, and his, the pastor, pastor of, lived two doors down from him and was walking by and saw this lawnmower. And said, hey, I'd like to buy that. And this little push mower with a pull start. The pastor took it home to his lawn, was trying to get it to work, and it couldn't get it to run. And he brought it back to the kid, and the kid, and he said, this lawnmower doesn't work, it's junk. And the little boy looked up and said, oh, mister, when you, put, when you work that lawnmower, you've got to cuss at that lawnmower. That lawnmower won't work unless you cuss. And the pastor was abrupt, and he said, well, well I'm a pastor. Why, why, I, I don't remember how to cuss. I, I, I've forgotten how to cuss. The little boy said, well, you just take that mower home, you keep pulling that rope, and those words will come back to you. So hopefully, these words will come back to me, but not the cuss words, what it is to preach a sermon in front of a congregation and the use of the Lord. Hey, today, um, we are going to deal with Ezekiel chapter 47. We're going to camp into the river of life. We're going to find that there's a river flowing from the throne of God that is going to bring healing, help, and mercy wherever it travels. Would you just track with me as we read this scripture together? I'm going to read this. The man brought me. Ezekiel is the person. He is a being led by a man. We don't know what kind of man, angelic. He is having a vision. 
He is a, at this point, he is a uh, captive in Babylon, and God is giving him what are what we would call millennial visions, what end times visions. God is giving him visions of the restoration of Israel. And so now in this picture, a man is going to be leading him into the water. A man is going to be leading him deeper into the water and then taking him back to the shore to see the results. So a man brought me, a man bringing Ezekiel back to the entrance of the temple because the water starts at the temple. And I saw the water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. And I put in there that it's about 1,750 feet. You can read and study that's maybe up to 2,200 feet, a long ways. So he went in 1,750 feet and then he led me into water that was finally ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and he led me into the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. Then he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? And then he led me back to the bank. The scripture is contextually a millennial vision of the healing of Israel. It speaks forthcoming to even the, the thousand year reign of Christ. If you've never heard of the millennial reign of Christ, you need to page through the book of Revelation and you'll see just what it is. And this speaks even to that day of the healing uh, of, of Christ, uh, of, of Israel. But I want to speak metaphorically today. Metaphorically, I think we can accurately draw out a meaning of sort of a dual fulfillment of what, what it says to us in 2022. And what it's going to speak to is the work and the moving of the Holy Spirit that is in the river of life. And then simply and secondly, following God into a deeper growing relationship into that river. And if we could sum up the whole sermon that I'm going to say today, we could sum it up in two words. And if you walk out of here, this is all you need to remember. You can shut me off and you can turn it off right now, but you can listen to these two words. And it's simply the words, go deeper. Where the Spirit of God wants to lead us, He wants to take us deeper. So go deeper. Just say that with me today. Go deeper. All right, we're done. <laughs> Katie, come and sing. <laughs> that was short. No, let's go on. Let's talk about the river. You know, before we do that, I I'm going to just mention this. This is the season of Lent. Now, many of you who didn't grow up in a, some mainline denomination go, Lent what? Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. A season of 40 days prior to Easter, a time of reflection, repentance, and calling upon the Lord. Now, many in our world have made it into form and ritual and have do it out of obligation. But I was a pastor this last previous to retirement for 11 years in a community church over in eastern Wisconsin. And in that church there, we, we had a church full of Catholics, Lutherans, and Methodists. I had basically no Assemblies of God people other than my wife and myself. And so these people grew up with the culture of honoring Lent. So guess what? In this church, we honored Lent and the Lenten season. Oh, we didn't do all the forms and the rituals, but we had special services throughout Lent. And we, it was a time of repentance. It was a time of reflection. It was a time of gathering together, a time of deepening our faith and growing in a spiritual walk with the Lord. Exactly what Ezekiel 47 is challenging us to do today. Now, 
I oddly enough thought I'd mention that, and I'd heard Eric sent you guys some email about Lent, and so I, and going through Mark, and I hope you do that. That's what we're tracking today. I think the Lord's just putting this together. Let's go deeper. Ezekiel 47, 1. I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple. The water coming from the temple is what? The river of God. It's the river of life. It is God's spirit that is flowing in this water. Everything that's good, anything that's great, anything that's awesome is flowing in this river. And notice the river, it's very wide. It's very shallow and then takes a long time to get deep. What did we say? I put it up there on your, on your board. 1,750 feet from the bank. You start out on the bank and you go 1,750 feet and you're finally just in ankle deep water. And then you go 1,750 and finally you're up to your knees. Then finally more and up to the waist and finally over your head. You've traveled, that river is way over a mile, almost a mile and a half wide before it gets to be deep enough to swim in and you're caught in the current. It's a long, slow process. And that's what I want us to see, that there is a progression in following God. That he starts out shallow. It doesn't happen all at once. It takes time and you slowly go deeper and deeper and deeper. God's desire, go deeper. Well, so we're going to do a little metaphor analogy today. You could maybe create your own, but this is what I've sort of chosen to, to look at the scripture at. Up in the, everybody starts in the bank, the bank of the river. We're up on the bank, it's dry. You don't get wet in the bank. We live in a nation that many people want to stay spiritually dry. They want, no, and I'm speaking especially in relationship to Christianity. Do you realize right today, 23%, 22%, depending on what you read, 22% of America is in church. Now, this isn't to say that the other 78% have no faith, but I want to show you a trend and, I, and some statistics that I'm going to share in, day, in moments ahead, so a trend of what is happening in our America. You know, you got to go back to 1972 when on an average typical Sunday in America, over 50% of the American population was in church. You go back 50 years and over 50% of America was always in church. Just see the trend. Don't make a judgment call. Just see the trend. There's a lot of people in our day and age that have looked at Christianity they're up on the bank of the river, and they've said, I want nothing to do with it. They want to stay dry. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light, and neither do they come to the light. You know why? This is what we have right here, some stats. Check this out. George Barna polls. Status, statistician extraordinaire for churches. Last 20 years, I just looked this stuff up this week. Uh, in 20, by 2020, he conducted 96,171 surveys of churches and Christians and the, all religions, everything. Here's his conclusions. Year 2000, they had set a criteria for what were practicing Christians. And he said, at this point, with that criteria, 45% of America were considered to be practicing Christians in the year 2000, 22 years ago. In the year 2020, though, now tw just up to 20 years, with the same criteria, George Barna states, 25% of America is now considered to be a practicing Christian by his definition that, that he has created, same definition. Do you see the trend? Don't make a judgment, just see the trend. Now, Gallup polls reflect exactly the same. And that's what, that is exactly 
what we have here, Gallup polls. Now, Gallup says that 70% of Americans said they belonged to a church. This is in the year 2000. A church, a synagogue, or a mosque. Now we're talking about Christians, Jews, and Muslims. But in the last 20 years, where it is now, is that 47% are belonging to a, a church organization. Gallup poll says it's a 23% drop. Barna says it's a 20% drop. Do you see a trend? We fast in America are going on a trend where churches are closing their doors. I don't know whether you realize this, and I've, I think I've heard Eric mention, Pastor Eric mention it a, a, a few times, but do you realize that 75, about 75 churches, and you can look at all sorts of statistics, and I'm going to give you one, and I hate to, bog, I'm not trying to bog you with this, but I want us to see that people are standing on the bank of the river, and they got reasons, they got, they've got decisions made of why they are staying dry. I want nothing, I don't want anything to do with the river, a religion. 75 churches, Christian churches, close their doors every week in America. This is bound and shown by statistic after stiff statistic and study after study. I don't, I'm not making this up, and I've been tracking this for a number of years, and this is exactly where we're still about at this point. Now, there are some startups, but we're going to find that even with the startups, there's a, it averages still down to 57 churches a week that shut their doors, closed, closed for business, or up for sale, or we're, we're gone. Do you see a trend going up and going down? Right now, here's from the U.S. Census Bureau. The United States Census Bureau pulled it off the Internet just this week. This is what, this is what it says. You can look it up and read it. 4,000, this is what the American census is saying, 4,000 churches close their doors for the final time every year. And they're saying that 1,000 churches start up. Their stat is that 3,000 churches are lost every year in America. Why do people want to stay dry? What is it about religion? What is it about church that people don't want to have anything to do with it? If you walked out on the street and said, I want to invite you to my church, why do they step back two paces and go like, eh, not for me. I'm on the bank. I'm staying on the bank. What's their number one beef? Hypocrites in the pew. How many hypocrites are here today? Raise your hand nice, loud, and clear. All they want is my money. We've heard all these. They've been flipping through cable TV shows at night, and they found some whacked out TV evangelist who's bizarro. Then there's the TV evangelist scams in the 2020 reports of illegitimate, irresponsible lifestyles of some of these guys, and it's turned people off. Add that to growing up in dead church, dead religion, form, ritual, and no life. They just say, want nothing to do with it. Religion is dead. Two more, st two, two more facts, and then I'm, then I'm done with statistics, okay? Our youth... I don't have it up there, but Lifeway Research has, you can read it, I read it this week in the internet. They need, Lifeway Research studies and says 66% of Christian kids are walking away from their faith once they hit college years. George Barna, the church statistician extraordinaire, his number is 64%. That's two, that's two out of the, my three grandchildren. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We must do better. Amen? Amen. The youth of our generation 
and post high school culture are fast becoming biblical and biblical illiterates. I'd go there, but there's too much stuff that's too crazy. People want to stay in the bank, they want to stay dry. We need to move on. Then you want to go, some people want, to, want enough of God to move near the river. They really don't want to step into the river, they just want to stand on the river bank right on the edge. Have you ever walked down to the ocean? Have you ever stood at the, 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 the edge of a raging river? You've been to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, we, my wife and I have stood there and the water's just roaring down and going down in the mist and oh, it's beautiful. And I love standing at the ocean's edge and, and seeing the, the, the beauty of the sunset and the waves and everything, the, 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 everything. It's beautiful. It stimulates the soul. It's, it stirs the heart. And people like to camp by the edge of the river. And that's what a lot of people like to do. They want to just get near. They want to come to a church, and I want you to just track with me in this analogy. They want to come to a church that says, I just want to feel good when I go to church. And now let's be clear. Our goal is not to have you come to church and feel bad. Everybody say amen. amen. We want you to walk out of here feeling good. But sometimes sermons afflict the comfortable. Sometimes sermons comfort the afflicted. But we all need to hear some sermons that afflict the comfortable. And the person that wants to be on the edge of the river wants the ocean view motel feel. They want the ambience of living on the edge of a golf course or some big old lodge. They don't want to hear anything that is life-changing or challenging. Please don't preach about sin I want to hear about the blood of Jesus and why we even need the blood of Jesus. I don't want to hear about eternity. I don't want to hear about death, hell, and the grave. Just make me feel good. Now, there's a place for all of that. And sometimes some can take it to extreme. There's a place to feel good and to, and to be challenged. But these people want to just be comfortable. I put it this way, I want $3 worth of God. This is not my poem, this is Wilbur Rees. I've had this in my file for ages. He said, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I would like to buy only three dollars worth of God, please. That's what a lot of our world wants to settle with. Let's go deeper. And he led me. God doesn't want us living on the bank. God doesn't want us to live on the edge. He wants to take us deeper. There's a progression. All right, we'll keep moving. Ezekiel 47, 3. As the man went eastward with the measuring line, he then led me through water that was ankle deep. What happens in ankle deep water? I put the word up there, uh, back there. I put the word up there, splash. Think about the spiritual splashing that people like to do. I'm just making this analogy. You can make it in any way you want to make it. What do, we, what do they do in ankle deep water? They, they film TV commercials. You've seen the picture of the horse with the bareback rider galloping in the ankle-deep water on the edge of the ocean, and the water's just spraying, and it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's exciting. It's fun, stimulating, cool, relaxing. And a lot of evangelicals camp there. And they don't want to go deeper. Let's just have fun. But God says... You need to go deeper. God is not out to have you be ankle deep into his spirit. Now he wants to take you knee deep. He leads you deeper. 
He measured off another thousand cubits. And he led me through water that was knee deep, another thousand cubits, and he led me through water that was up to my waist. Have you ever been in knee deep water? Or how about there? That is really rushing and roaring. It's hard to stand. When I was in the Northwest Territories on a hunt, now some of you are anti-hunters, I apologize. <laughs> but when I was in the Northwest Territories on a hunt, a backpack hunt, I was hunting doll sheep. That's a white sheep with some big horns. We flew into this one, I and a guide flew into this one very extreme, I mean, we're way by the Arctic Circle, and we flew into this one extremely remote area, landed on, it's not an airstrip, it's just a bumpy piece of place where there happened to be some bare ground. And we went to go like 10, 12 miles up into the mountains with our, with our heavy packs. And the guide said, but we have to cross this river first, which we'd seen from the air and saw in a distance. And my guide was well seasoned and well experienced. And he was very, he was afraid. He was tense. I picked up on it real quick. And he told me, because it's going to be very dangerous, we got to cross this. It had been raining. The water was up. The water was very, very murky. You could not see the bottom. It was a stony bottom, but there were holes and pits and deep pockets, and the current was strong. And he said, if you lose, if you fall, you're going to have to dump your pack and save your life. And then he tells me the story about the guy that drowned. So this was going to be serious business. We walked into this raging wa water, just inching. And you could feel the surge. You could feel the river moving against you. It was pushing. It was taking you. It was, you're fighting against it. Well, we made it to our spot, and I just end the story, we've got that animal. But we crossed the river and I lived. Here's the analogy. And you can forget about the slide first. When you start getting into the river that is knee deep, you begin to feel the surge. I covet that for you. I covet that for my grandkids. That they will begin to feel the surge of the Spirit of God move in their life. That when they walk into the sanctuary, they will be stepping into moving, living water. As a pastor, numerous times I had my church, as we may do at the end of this service, come up and just sort of bunch in around the altar. And we'd sing that, that chorus, this is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, it's holy Then we lift our hands. These are holy hands. We lift in, we're lifting up holy hands. For the Lord is present and where he is, it's holy. And you get a mass of people singing that song and the presence of God inhabits the praises of his people, and he would move in, and I guarantee you, you begin to feel the surge. And I'd look down, and there's some hardcore teenager. His hand lifted up. All of a sudden, God touched his spirit. All of a sudden, God's getting a hold of his life. And he went from thinking it's just dry dust to realizing this is life. God's presence, it's real. Feel the surge. 
What a beautiful thing when we can come together and feel the surge. Why do people want to attend this church? Good preaching, but hopefully that happens. Beautiful music led by Katie. Beautiful worship team, Alex and the rest. A star stellar team running the soundboards and all that back there. A beautiful facility. Why do they want to come to this church? Great programs, nice people. Do you know why they need to come to this church? They need to walk into the doors of this church and they need to know the reality that God is. And that he is sensed and he is alive and he is moving in your midst. That is what will bring them back. Otherwise, they can go down to the club down the street and meet with people who are here to meet with God. Oh, we got to go deeper, keep moving here. Waist deep, less of me showing. He led me to the water that's up to the waist. All of a sudden, I'm up to the waist. Here's my analogy that I would use. When you're up to your ankles, there's a lot of your flesh showing. You're living like your flesh, and when you walk to your knees, there's still a lot of your flesh showing, but now you've decided I'm going to start crucifying my flesh. I'm walking into the river, and I've got, well, half of me is buried. I've got more to go, but half of me is put under the power of the cross. He led me deeper, and there's a fight there. There's a war. Do we go deeper, or do we want to go back to the shore? Eric has said it, and you've heard it. God loves you like you are, and he takes you like you are, but he loves you enough. He loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. We've got to go deeper. Now we're deep enough, and we're caught in the current. He measured off the water another thousand uh, cubits. Now the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. This is a life that's given himself over to God. He said, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none will go with me, I'm going to follow. I'm in. I'm jumping in, both feet. That's what some of you that are going to get baptized in a couple weeks, that's exactly what you are doing. You're finally saying and coming to a realization, whoever you are, you're saying, I'm all in. This is it. This is my commitment. And that's why God has you go publicly and stand before a crowd and say, I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart. I'm going to, yeah, we're going to put me under symbolically and bring me up. You've never been baptized. You need to do that. I'm all in. Have you ever made that choice? Where are you? <laughs> I hope you're making that choice. I read it this week in the, in the scripture in Numbers chapter 14. It was talking about Caleb. You remember Caleb and Joshua. Joshua and the Bible says, Caleb wholly followed the Lord. I don't know what I want said about me, but I want it said about me specifically that I'm sure that I wholly followed the Lord. Well, what's the results? We have to go on. We started out at the bank. We went to the edge. We are up to the ankles, up to the knees, up to the waist. Now we're up over the head. The river's taking us wherever we want to go, wherever the river wants to go. We're in the flow. What are the results? Well, Ezekiel said, here's what, what this tour guide asked Ezekiel. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. The salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live uh, salt water becomes fresh. I lost track on that. Okay, let's go there. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large number of fish because this water flows that will make the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, 
everything will live. Where the river flows, everything lives. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. The leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. I don't know what you see, but I see life. Trees, life. Not dead trees, alive trees, healthy trees. I see fresh. I see healing. Think about that. Salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures. That's what it is when we step into God's river. I see fruit trees. Fruit trees of all kinds. They'll grow on both of the banks. The leaves don't wither. The fruit will not fail. Each month they bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows on them. A mature tree brings forth fruit. Oh, blessed is the man. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, Jeremiah says, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the waters that sends out its roots by a stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves will always be green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now, I'm really glad that you're here today, and I'm not here to pound down any single person or any individual about your faith. I'm just thrilled that you are here, that I am encouraging you what the Word of God has put into my heart to share with you this week. Go deeper. Wherever you're at, go deeper. Some of you need to take the first step and start your walk. Maybe you never have invited Christ to be in your life. I don't have a clue who is here today, but I want to just ask you this. Do you have a conversion story? You were tracking through life. You were going through your life, and then all of a sudden, boom, you realize, hey, I need more than what I've got. Do you have a conversion story? God wants to write that in your heart. I remember when I was just a five-year-old boy, Madison, Wisconsin, the Holy Spirit moved into my room. I was like five or six. I think it was five. For whatever I realized, I realized that night, I can still remember that night, and I, I got on my knees on the side of my bed, and I said, Jesus, come into my life. At that young little age, somehow that night I caught it. And I, I don't remember anything about five years old other than that night. That's the only night I remember. How about this? If you start your walk, deepen your walk, what's the next step? Take the next step. Maybe for some it's water baptism. Maybe it's some your Bible, Bible knowledge is not right. Maybe it needs to be deeper. Maybe it's daily disciplines you need. Maybe it's time in the Word. Just reading the Bible. Set yourself a discipline. You know what? I've found so many Christians never open a Bible for seven days until the next Sunday. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. I, even I, as a pastor, who have, I've studied the Bible for years and years and years. You get retired. And then it's a whole lot easier to sort of just sit back and, uh, you know, I'm just going to, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to get deep into reading anything. You know, and, and, and in recent days, I've reconstructed my life and I've said, I am getting back into, back into reading God's word and forthwith learning. And you know what I found? I've found there's stuff I'm reading again today that just, just this last week, I'm going like, hey, I don't even remember that. It begins to challenge your heart. Grow in your passion for Christ. Grow in your worship. Revive your walk. I don't have any simple and easy answers other than to say that God will honor us if we will, if we will seek him. The old hymn, Come Thou Fount, has the words, and I grew up with this hymn, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, Here, Lord, take my heart. Come and seal it. Come and seal it for thy courts above. 
Why do we need revival? We all do. We all do. Because sometimes we wander. Sometimes we get a little indifferent, lackadaisical. Where does the Lord want to take us? He wants to take us deeper. I'm going to close with just this one final scripture here. Hosea says this. Come. Let us return to the Lord. He is speaking to a backslidden Israel. And he's saying, come. Come. Let's return to the Lord. Let us know. And then he sort of stops. He says, no. Let us press on to know. He doesn't say just let us know. No, let us press on to know the Lord. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. How many worry about the sun coming up? We never do. As surely as the sun rises, he will, he will appear. Uh, he will come as the showers, like the spring rain. He says, come, let's all stand. I'm going to open up this altar today. I don't know whether you're used to doing this or whether you're not used to doing this. I'm not here to force anybody to do this. Katie's just going to lead us in a couple of songs. Let's just come and let's just stand here. The altar in the Bible is always representative of a place where man meets God. Now you can meet God in your pew. But today we're just asking you, just as a body, before we go from this place, we'll have a closing prayer. But let's have this song. Let's sing this as unto the Lord as she leads. Go ahead, Katie. You call me out upon the waters. The great Let's come and stand in his presence today. Yes, Lord. Who feed me. Spirit, leave me where my trust is with.
the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you Jesus, we just pray that you will take these sacred thoughts and that you will seal them in our heart. And that in the days ahead, you will challenge our hearts to grow in you and follow you. Spirit, lead us. Take us deeper than our feet could go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I believe Katie's going to lead one more song. There's going to be no further dismissal. You just feel free to stand and sing and worship or be dismissed as you need to go. God bless each one of you. Thank you so much. There's nothing worth more There will never come close Nothing Tasty.
So 